So when I was on around 58,000 or so subscribers, I said, hey, I'm nearly at 60,000 subscribers. That's an arbitrary round number. Let's do one of those Q&A videos I've seen on other channels. So I asked my subscribers to throw some questions at me that weren't questions I'd normally answer in my standard videos. Um, more personal questions, I guess. So this is probably the most YouTube-y thing I've planned to do. And now by the time I've collected the questions and got round to making a video, I seem to have 70,000 subscribers, which is absurd. So thank you so much for following me and supporting me. I hope you're still enjoying the videos and that I keep entertaining and bringing you useful information. I've had more and more interesting people get in touch over the last month, so hopefully this channel will become even more interesting to you over the rest of the season. I've got big plans and I'm going to start working on some bigger ideas, including some longer form video essays. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, the Q&A. So I pulled together questions from the pile, it's not all of them, but hopefully it's more of the most frequently asked questions, and interesting enough, you can maybe get to know the floating voice behind the videos a bit more. There's some stuff here on me, my background, my opinions and stuff, I'll try and keep it interesting. Let's go. Question 1 from Pinkyful. Your animations are nice. Where did you learn to make them, if formally done so, or is it something you've taught yourself? Well, honestly it's self-taught. I did want to go and take a night course in design and animation, but I couldn't really afford it, so I just kept doing it and doing it until I became better at it. I'm a fairly quick learner with creative software and it, the best way to learn, for me at least, is just to sit down with it and say, I want to do this thing, whatever it is you want to do. So say you want to have an animation of a car driving around around a globe like this. And then you sit down and try and work out how to do it piece by piece. And once you've figured that out, you'll have learned loads in the process of learning along the way about the software, about tricks you can use, shortcuts to piece animations together, and about your own strengths. I'm definitely learning continuously as I make these videos, as you can probably tell. With almost every video I make, I try and do something I haven't done before so I can learn a little bit more. And, and you can do a lot with very little. The first five-ish videos on this channel, the ones that look a little bit different to the current ones, were all made intricately in PowerPoint in time to my voice audio. I mean, it wasn't easy, but you can do it. The King Cognito asks, what exactly makes you interested in F1? Well, first of all, like all sports, what actually makes F1 interesting is the storylines and the characters and the soap opera of it all. Even getting angry at the stupid decisions teams, organisers, rule makers, etc. make all part of the fun and we all know it. I do love the technology side of it though, and when I was going through school and starting to specialise into maths, physics and mechanics, it was fun to connect everything I was learning with everything I knew about the sport. Even in art class I chose to do a module on Formula 1. Here's a picture I drew when I was 17, for example. Uh, I was big into Montoya then. What a guy he was. Um, but actually, I also enjoy the way the rules are put together, I enjoy the politics, the infighting, I get really interested by the broadcasting and the presentation. I think it's just this massive ground for me really to nerd out over basically any part of the massive machine. Sam asks, what is your favourite F1 game? Okay, I haven't played F1 2017, believe it or not, but I have got F1 2016, and I think that's definitely the most accomplished F1 game I've played to date. And I assume F1 2017 is in a similar vein from what I've seen on YouTube channels like Tiet Marduk. F1 2017 is the only Codemasters series I haven't played, including the Wii one. Um, I haven't played the Super Sim games like uh, Assetto Corsa and R-Factor, so I can't really comment on those. But you know, actually, the F1 game I spent the most time with and had the most enjoyable time was Grand Prix 4, which uh, came out in 2001. You know, at the time it felt like a real simulation and it had proper damage, sort of. And the marshals would come out onto the track and push up a car away. It was awesome. I played that for years. On a keyboard, no less. You didn't get an F1 game every year back then. It was slim pickings, though the licence wasn't so restricted either. On a related note, Martinez Dorgler asks, Do you race in real life? I do not. I used to be at a karting championship at Castle Coombe when I was a teenager, uh, but I couldn't afford to carry it on beyond 16. My closest karting track was Buckmore Park, and that place is swish. I do want to go karting occasionally though, but it's a bit pricey and I don't know anyone who'd go along. So maybe Karen Chandok would have me one day. A guy can dream. This next question from John Berry. If you could work in any F1 team in any position, except driver, which would it be? It's weird, if you asked me this a few years ago, I'd probably have loved to be a mechanical engineer of some kind, and that would have been cool. But these days, I think a media role would be pretty good. I really like what I'm doing in this channel, and what's great is connecting other people to the things you love, and that you think they'd love. F1 has been uh, very closed off compared to lots of sports and organisations, and we've been seeing that change over recent years, but it'd be very cool to be part of that. I mean, my ideal role wouldn't be in a team, but within maybe the Formula 1 organisation or another external media organisation, as media within teams tends to always have a marketing angle attached. Incidentally, random fact, I grew up in Biggin Hill, which is the hometown of the Formula 1 management and where all the live TV is broadcast from and where all their media base is. Matt Owen asks here, if you could make one change to F1, what would it be? <laughs> this, okay, this is a tricky one. Uh, I thought about it, and you might hate me. Honestly, I think I'd add a cost cap. If I could do just, if I had just one thing I could do, I would add a cost cap. 
I know we can argue about what engines to use and what error we'd allow and so on and so on, but the same problem we see over and over and over again is costs spiralling out of control and the distance between the weaker and stronger teams widening. With a cost cap, we can at least force everyone to work with more similar resources and let the best people win, not just the biggest wallets, which means whenever you bring in rule changes, you know, technical rule changes or whatever, the teams still have this limited amount of resources which to work with these rule changes. So it doesn't mean think people like Mercedes can throw $100 million at revising their aero package to fit the new rules. And it's the competition that's exciting. I haven't extensively researched this position and I can't say I've thought of all the knock-on effects, but that's my gut instinct, a cost cap. And similarly, but in a different direction, AfroJD asks, if you could change one thing about F1's marketing, what would it be and why? Well, Afro, I would introduce some marketing. Okay, now maybe that's a little unfair. F1 has been doing a fair bit of marketing these days, but the most visible marketing we see is the act of social engagement and media presence online. But it still has problems. Answer me this, who is F1 marketing itself to? I'm not asking who F1's audience is or who it should be. I'm asking who is F1 directing its come watch us message to right now? Who is it trying to speak to? It's not really obvious, is it? How about this? What is F1's marketing message? Why does F1 think we should watch it? I don't think that's clear either. And that's part of Liberty's plan is to actually put a marketing plan and voice in place. Do you know what position they're advertising for earlier this year? Head of communications. Because there wasn't one. Ever. They've never had a head of communications. So to change F1's marketing, I would literally do something, anything. Shout from a mountain about the Seven Lewis rivalry. Scream about the innovative but controversial engines. Connect with national broadcasters to start a worldwide connected campaign. Something. You know how I just said I lived in the hometown of F1? Literally only this year have they put up a sign outside their building. Here's a picture I took myself. And now a question with a sad answer from Tejas van Leith. Are you going to a Grand Prix this year? I am not. I have almost no money to my name, so I definitely can't afford to attend a race. The last time I went to a race was Turkey 2008, amazingly. So it'll be over 10 years between races. I'm definitely overdue one, I think. Niels Lanenecht asks probably the most common question I get asked on this channel. How do you know all the stuff you explain? Well, I'm not an engineer, but I have a background in mathematics and physics. And even before I went to university, I'd go off and try to research anything in F1 I didn't know the answer to. I mean, as best as I could, the internet really wasn't what it is today back then. I've also had family friends from when I was an infant who'd take me to races and rally and introduce me to the world of motorsport and mechanics. I still have a lot of people come up to me today saying, I knew you and you were knee high and you could name every car on the road. Because when I was two years old, that's how people knew me. Uh, but to answer your question, I've always been interested in this stuff. I have a physics background, so that normally gets me 7 to 80% of the way there. And then I research the rest thoroughly to make sure I get it as accurate as possible. It's just been a constant, constant research and interest over a couple of decades now with solid science and maths background that helps me understand what I'm researching. I mean, really what I'm doing here is science communication. And if I make a mistake, I'll try and pin a comment under the video. Rayman, uh, not the guy with no arms, as I understand it, asks... Should there be a racetrack in the streets of London in 2020? And I say, no. That is a solid no. I've thought about this because it used to be a nice dream, didn't it? But actually, it'd be rubbish in practice. The roads wouldn't be well suited for it. Everywhere is too cramped. It would wreck the city for weeks. The racing would be rubbish. And there's an incredible international racing circuit just up the M1. And London doesn't need it. It's London. Everybody already goes to London. In my opinion, F1 doesn't need to be a sightseeing operation. You don't need Big Ben or the Statue of Liberty in the background to have a good race or a good atmosphere. You need good tracks, good racing, and to treat the attendees well. And it all comes together. London can't do that. No one would have a good time. Todd Ivanov asks, Besides F1, what are your interests and hobbies? Uh, I mean, I generally enjoy science and art, but that's probably obvious too. Um, I'm a big fan of movies and I devour anything to do with filmmaking and production. I actually really like and enjoy editing, which is only a minor part of the videos you see on this channel. Uh, I'm hoping in future to be able to start including a bit more filmed pieces into this channel, but we'll see how that goes. Um, I can drum a little bit and photograph a little bit. I'm also interested in sex and sexual health and politics, and I work with people in that field quite a bit as an illustrator. And I'm trying to get back into painting again. I've got a canvas, an easel and paints all ready to go. I just need the, the will and the time. Electro Gaming asks... Who are you hoping to win the 2018 championship? And you know what? Almost every year, I'm never particularly rooting for someone, as long as it's interesting. I love an underdog, and I don't want anyone to run away with it. In fact, if someone is running away with the championship, I tend to start supporting the person who's chasing them. And if they overtake and start running away with it, then I'll shift back to the other person. Um, I do have a soft spot for Daniel Ricciardo, though, so it would be great if he could mount a challenge from the back. The worst is when you want 
both rivals to win. I was a fan of Young Hamilton back in 2008, but how could you not want Massa to win too? God, what a heartbreaking finale that was. I wanted everyone to win. In 2010, when four awesome drivers were in with a chance at the title, how could you be sad to see any of them claim it? But obviously Webber was my man. God, maybe I just have a thing for Australians. Daniel Kartoff asks, Do you think Formula E will be more popular than Formula 1 in the near future? No. Not even slightly. Not ever. Formula E sits in an interesting niche, and that's where it belongs. I don't think it aims to be as big as top tier series. I think it does really well at what it is, developing electric racing cars to showcase technology around the world, which it's doing pretty well, and I think aims to do even better over the next few years. What's good about Formula E is watching it bend over backwards to try and be interesting and successful and engaging. It's trying new things with how it shapes itself and reaches fans, which is something F1 hasn't really been doing as it's too happy to rest on its laurels. CPM Productions asks, do you like the new F1 logo? Uh, I didn't, but now I do. Um, I did really, really like the old one, and I was surprised to find so many people who didn't. It was iconic to me, even if it was a bit harder to use as part of a wider brand identity. The new one is fine. It's, you know, a decent enough logo, but I hate the new font and the way they're using it. It's not a font that works at all for anything but titles. And F1 are using it to write sentences with. Ugh. And I don't like a lot of the branding stuff around the logo. I hate these container designs that they put the sponsors in. They look awful to me. I think simplicity and clarity is the most important thing with graphics and design, which is why all of the stuff on my channel is kind of as simple as possible. And I built on that style while trying to keep the simple concept that hopefully everyone can understand. Um, I did a quick Twitter thread on the on-screen graphics during Melbourne practice, and I might expand on that and do a video on my thoughts about some too at one point. ANF ask, what programs do you use for doing your videos? Uh, I use most of Adobe CC Suite. Um, all in all, uh, almost every video makes use of Photoshop, Audition, After Effects, and Premiere Pro. Uh, Jonah Chavinsky asks, is there any way we'll get behind the scenes video or something similar? Smiley face. I'm working on making one, but it will be for Patreon. Um, I can't imagine how interesting it will be, though. Um, I mean, it'll be really interesting. Sign up to my Patreon now. A quick plug for my Patreon, by the way. For every video, I try and post a little behind the scenes sketch or snippet or something. Javier Ruiz asks, would you prefer working for an F1 team, working for the FIA, or working for Liberty, and why? So, my answer is probably not an F1 team. Uh, Liberty would be fun, for reasons I've labelled earlier, but the FIA might be even more fun. People get really angry at the rules and regulations that are brought in, but it is so hard to map out the rules to a game or sport, especially one as complicated as F1. Keeping the game balanced and fair, solving problems without causing new ones, or dealing with the political fallout, working how to actually police any rule you come up with, and how to actually word rules that you come up with. That's really hard and actually really interesting work. I think over the years a lot of the rules have made a lot of unintentional consequences, which would be fun to unpick. The reason the cars all look fairly identical is because every time some area of development starts to get out of control, the FAA just box off an area and the space around the car and say, you can't do stuff here now. So all the cars have to sort of fit into a more and more restrictive box. Um, anyway, it's still Liberty, because I reckon working for the FAA would be an absolute nightmare, full of politics and infighting and mind games. And I haven't got time for that. And finally, Matt asks one of the most frequently asked questions I get in um, life, other than when you're getting a haircut. What is the story behind the name Chain Bear? Okay, this isn't that interesting a story, but I'll tell you anyway. Uh, a long time ago, my partner at the time and I used to play a game together where one of us would draw out phonetic clues to things like movies or books, and the other would have to guess what they meant. So like I could type in, fin, eat, tea, vase, or something to give an example. It's Infinity Wars, by the way. Anyway, one time the clue was this. And I kept saying chain bear of sea crates over and over again, which was hilarious because I was saying the answer chamber of secrets without realising it. So from that, we called the game chain bear. And if you got to the point where you were literally sounding out the game without realising it, that was called going chain bear. Uh, later on, we made a webcomic together with the character we named after the game. And then the Twitter handle followed. And 10 years later, this. Incidentally, the yellow colour I use in my videos has been the Chain Bear signature colour from the very beginning. The pink was added a few years ago. Bit of branding trivia for you there. Exciting. Uh, and that's my first Q&A for you. Um, how did you find it? Hopefully not ridiculously boring and nobody asked any embarrassing questions, so I dodged a bullet there. Uh, I might do another one at an arbitrary point if anyone fancies it. In the meantime, thank you so much for getting me to a milestone in the first place. Uh, I'm not really good at accepting that people actually enjoy this channel, but I still kind of think everyone's going to realise I'm rubbish any day now and it will come crashing down. But for now, I'm glad you're here.
next video, normal service resumes.